Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. For Telesur, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, uh, Venezuela. To begin, the delegation of the FARC guerrilla has issued a statement laying out a set of steps towards becoming a legal political force. Now, the announcement comes as the Colombian Senate has been debating a measure that would prevent former guerrillas from participating in politics. Another important issue uh, that will be discussed in the current round of talks is paramilitary groups, which continue operating throughout the country. But uh, let's review uh, the main steps proposed by the FARC to become a political force. One of the main uh, points to, is to guarantee that the guerrillas' future party will be registered legally for an indefinite period of time to allow it to participate in the country's next elections. Together with that demand, the rebel group is also requesting a quota of seats in Parliament and in the Senate. This would allow the political force to voice its concerns and to assure that the national peace agenda, which is part of the final agreement, will be fulfilled. Given the large areas controlled by FARC throughout Colombia, the group is also requesting support from the government to transform the local economy of this areas, since right now they are operating as war-oriented economies. And finally, the group uh, urges the government to help create social conditions which can allow peace to be permanent. The European Union representative at Colombia's peace talks has pledged Europe's support for both the talks and the post-conflict reconstruction. Elman Gilmore from Ireland met President Santos in Bogota on Wednesday. The Colombian leader told him he hoped that a final peace agreement could be signed before the March deadline that both sides have already agreed. And with more uh, on the progress of the Colombian peace talks, uh, we turn to our correspondent now, Natalia Margarita. She's there in the capital of Bogota. Hey there, Natalia. Uh, what does that report say exactly, and has the FARC fulfilled its commitment with the unilateral ceasefire? Uh, hi, Cody. There. This is the latest of eight reports that different social organizations that have been monitoring all the FARC's uh, unilateral ceasefire submit on this issue. According to the, uh, this latest report, refers specifically for the period of time uh, between the 20th of September and the 20th of October. During that time, uh, the report says that uh, the FARC has not... Uh, made any single uh, offensive action, meaning that the FARC has complied 100% with its unilateral ceasefire during that month. Secondly, in terms of the actions of the Colombian army, they said that uh, the report says that they can, the social organizations also observed uh, a reduction on the offensive actions by the military, meaning not just the FARC has been complying to its unilateral ceasefire, but there in the ground, in the Colombian rural territories, they have also observed a decrease on army offensive operations. However, uh, the report also raises concern regarding uh, how the military is uh, seizing uh, um, more territories. And at some point, uh, this will lead probably to confrontations with the FARC. So they have also insist and call once again on the Colombian government to agree to a bilateral ceasefire. And finally, something that it's also very important to highlight here, uh, Cody, is that the report uh, points out uh, the paramilitarism as currently the main and the biggest threat, not just for the unilateral ceasefire of the FARC, but to an eventual bilateral ceasefire and in general to the peace process. They say that they have observed a resurgence of paramilitarism, especially in five state departments of Colombia, and that this is indeed putting at risk, as I said before, not just the ceasefire, but the peace process in general, Cody. And Natalia, do we know if this uh, report, uh, to, you were talking about that, but to what extent will it have uh, an effect on the peace talks in Havana? I would say especially the issue of paramilitarism, and not just because it's a, it's a very highly concerning point in this report, but also because over the course of the last week, we have had two other different reports by other uh, institutions for peace studies that highlight and insist on this same issue of paramilitarism. 
uh, all researchers and social organizations have said that they will uh, submit all these reports uh, to Havana uh, because in the wake of the current peace negotiations and particularly the issues of an eventual bilateral and definitive ceasefire, uh, the government must definitely commit to tackle paramilitarism here in Colombia, Cody. All right, Natalia, thanks so much. See you later. Back to you. And the Colombian government uh, has uh, legalized the use of medical medicinal marijuana, I should say. President Juan Manuel Santos's uh, cabinet issued a decree that allows the cultivation and commercialization of marijuana with medical and research purposes. The measure represents a radical change in Colombia's drug policy. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is speaking in Geneva with the 47 nation United Nations Human Rights Council. President Maduro highlighted his government's commitment uh, to human rights and explained that by winning a seat at the UN body, uh, the world had shown its support to the Venezuelan government. However, the president warned that his country has been under constant assault by the United States government. The clearest evidence of this was the 2002 coup attempt against then president. Hugo Chavez. Y siempre Venezuela. And President Nicolás Maduro. Venezuela has been the victim of almost two decades of constant harassment by the United States. You know, Venezuela suffered a coup d'etat planned in finance in April of 2002. Even before the invasion of Iraq, declassified documents show how it was prepared, the way in which hatred was created to manipulate the population, the coordinated international efforts to isolate Venezuela government and to justify the coup. Students from Ayotzinapa, Mexico, clashed uh, with policemen. Some 130 students traveling in three different buses were on their way back to Ayotzinapa. When police began chasing them, the students were forced out of their buses and were heavily beaded. 13 students were detained but have been liberated. Our correspondent in Mexico City, uh, Clayton Connie, is uh, live to bring us an update on uh, that story. Uh, Clayton, these events, uh, they're very similar to those uh, last year, which led to the disappearance, um, which led to the disappearance of the 43 students. Why did the policemen begin uh, chasing the buses there, do we know? Cody, from what we understand, yesterday around 5 p.m., uh, students, like you mentioned, 130, but we also hear that there were maybe 200 students uh, were traveling in eight buses that they had commandeered uh, to participate in an event and to also uh, collect funds to participate in an event this weekend to commemorate uh, a previous police uh, attack on the students in previous years. Uh, from what we understand, and the students also commandeered uh, a gas tanker truck, which prompted the, the police to attack them. However, the police attack was very brutal. There are videos that have been uh, uploaded to the internet by the students themselves who were on the buses, and the, the students themselves were not even to, uh, able to get off the buses. The police were firing tear gas directly into the vehicles, breaking windows, and chasing them into the hills. And so what are the, what are the students saying now? What, what kind of actions might they take now? Well, the students, uh, of course, are on alarm. They're, they're alerted. Uh, from what you mentioned previously, the 13 were detained but later released. Um, but there are 20 who were injured, eight seriously who are hospitalized, one with a fractured skull, as well as another who was a survivor of the police attack uh, on September 26, 2014. So the students are all highly uh, alerted, as well as parents of the missing 43 students uh, and social and civil human rights organizations of the regions. Uh, they're due to give press conferences today to, to talk about their next actions, uh, what's going to happen in the next hours, as well as the next days. All right, Clayton Kahn reporting there from the capital, Mexico City. Clayton, thank you. Thanks. Moving on, Bolivia has announced plans uh, to build its first nuclear research center at a cost of $300 million. The controversial project will be built in La Paz in the city of El Alto uh, and will include a research reactor. But President Evo Morales says it will not harm the environment. Our uh, Bolivian correspondent now, Dimitri Odano, reports from La Paz. Is the site where Bolivia will build its first nuclear research plant. 
Located on the outskirts of La Paz in the city of El Alto, the government was forced to move the project here after the original location was opposed by locals. The new 20 hectare site has plenty of space but lacks basic infrastructure and services. But locals say the area, known as District 8, will soon be transformed. We have no basic services here, but soon we are going to have everything. And this is why we accepted the center in our area. We were the only country in South America that did not have a nuclear research center of this type, and that's why we are in favor of it. We are not afraid of any radiation that may come from the nuclear center. The $300 million project will include a radiotherapy facility, a research unit which will focus on creating new drugs, and a nuclear research center which will be used solely for education. The nuclear power plant will eventually use a mixture of both Russian and Argentine technology. The government says its new research centre is part of a peaceful civilian nuclear power programme that was announced last year and is supported by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Critics of the nuclear project say the government is not being honest about its plans for the centre. It's not going to be a health centre. It's a centre of nuclear research that does not depend on the Ministry of Health. The centre will not be located inside a hospital. The government says research from the centre will benefit everybody, help develop new medicines and scientists will start work on improving food production and alternative forms of energy. The research from the centre, both basic and applied, will be used in different areas of our country, in the economy and for development. The nuclear facility should be ready in five years, giving a much needed boost to Bolivia's fledgling scientific and technological industries. Dimitri O'Donnell, Telesur, La Paz. Former Peruvian President Alberto Fujimori, who is serving an eight-year sentence in jail over human rights abuses, is still participating in politics there. According to an investigation by some Peruvian media, the president is advising his daughter, Kiko Fujimori, ahead of the 2016 general elections. The former president is drafting his daughter's government plan. Furthermore, records show that his visitors in prison include local authorities. According to sources quoted by the media, the former president would be involved in drafting projects for governments from his party. On Thursday night, 21 members of an elite Israeli military undercover force raided the al hatli hospital in Hebron and shot dead a 27-year-old Palestinian. Now, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, the commandos wanted to question Azam al shaladeh who was in the hospital awaiting surgery after being shot by Israeli security forces. His cousin, Abdullah, attempted to prevent them from doing so after they barged into Azam's hospital room. Subsequently, the Israelis opened fire and killed, killed Abdullah. Uh, three Israeli forced, three, three Israeli force then arrested Azam and took him away. Iraq's Kurdish fighters launched a new offensive to oust the Islamic State from the city of Sinjar. The town, known for its significant Yazidi population, was taken over by the terrorist group a year ago. The Iraqi army had been coordinating the operation for weeks, but the mission had been pushed back due to street strategic concerns. Operation Free Sinjar is being backed by U.S.-led coalition warplanes and has now closed in on three fronts in a bid to cut off Islamic State supply lines. ISF forces uh, have begun to encircle Ramadi. In fact, they've almost completed the encirclement of Ramadi. Uh, Iraqi forces are attacking from all sides, from the north, south, the east, and the west. Uh, and this encirclement is beginning to squeeze uh, the Daesh fighters, the ISIS fighters, uh, that have been occupying Ramadi since the summer. Uh, they're operations continue, all of it supported by coalition air power uh, from the skies. According to Turkish uh, state media now, police are looking for 11 suspected Islamic State militants there in helicopter-backed raids that are targeting the group across Istanbul. The raids were part of a series of operations against suspected militants inside Turkey where security is being tightened ahead of the G20 summit set to begin on November 15th. 
The anti-terror squad operation is still underway and more people might be arrested. For more uh, on that story, we go to our correspondent near, uh, now, Noor Harazin. Uh, Noor, can you tell us uh, why was uh, interrogating Assam al-Shalam so important uh, for Israel? Hey, Noor, can you hear me? It appears that she uh, cannot uh, hear me, unfortunately, so we will go back to her. If we can get her back on the line for now, we'll continue uh, with the broadcast here. Uh, what started off as peaceful demonstrations against anti-austerity measures in Greece, they took a turn for the worse. Three separate demonstrations in central Athens, where nearly 25,000 people participated, they ended in violence after some 150 demonstrators threw petrol bombs at Greece's National Bank. They reportedly vandalized shops and bus stops. Some threw Molotov cocktails at police who retaliated there as we're seeing with tear gas. This was the first nationwide walkout called by Greece's largest private and public sector unions in a year. In Malta, EU uh, leaders met with African heads of state to discuss uh, the ongoing influx of migrants to the Schengen area. European Union ministers urged African nations to improve living conditions and migra migratory controls, which can help stop large numbers of migrants from arriving to Europe. The European Commission allocated almost $2 billion to African countries for projects designed to address the root causes of the migration crisis. But some African leaders have already criticized the sum being offered as insufficient. And before uh, the meeting, while speaking to the press, the British Home Secretary uh, stated just how the group felt the migrant crisis should be handled. We need to break the link between me people making the journey across to Europe and reaching Europe and being able to settle there. In order to do that, of course, we need to be able to return people to countries in Africa. That will be part of the discussions today. But also we need to smash the gangs that are actually the criminal gangs that are making money out of human misery. Is Africa in the... And national border controls, uh, that was on the top of the agenda for the final day of the Malta Summit on Migration. Sweden has already announced um, that they are introducing border controls, and the EU leaders still seem to be at odds on that touchy topic. Yeah, it's reasonable, based on common sense, uh, but we have the same difficulties as uh, we have in the discussions in the, in the European Union. The basic points are not clarified. Many people think here that migration is a positive thing. Uh, the European experiences just uh, provide evidences the opposite. Now migration is not a win-win situation for those countries from where they are coming and they arrive, but rather it's a lose-lose situation and we don't speak openly about it. So we should, we should change uh, uh, the language of the discussions and do not consider migration as a positive thing because it's totally against the impression of the European system. On Wednesday, thousands of opposition sympathizers uh, demonstrated in the Haitian capital against President Michel Martelly. Uh, they accused him of orchestrating an electoral coup d'etat in most recent presidential elections. Uh, Jovenel Moise, the presidential candidate backed by the president, drew 32 percent of ballots on October 25th. On Monday, seven presidential candidates called for an independent investigation of the results over claims of fraud. Well, it is uh, not necessarily a recent trend in Mexico. Artistic expressions around hip-hop continue to grow more and more popular among the country's urban youth there. For a Mexican group, the genre is key to tackling social issues. Our correspondent Clayton Khan now with more. Through beats, rhymes, and fresh tracks, this group from Mexico City's working class neighborhoods form part of the Women Working Hip Hop Collective. Although they draw their roots from hip hop's beginnings in the United States, they say they now have their own identity. We create with our own characteristics, speaking about what we have been through here in Mexico, how we experience things, and we connected those stories to those of migrants. And I think it was around that that this began to grow. We didn't have many references of rap in Spanish, because back then there was hardly any. 
The 13-strong group has garnered the attention of many, even gaining some commercial success. Yet their artistic and cultural expression is grounded in what they argue is hip-hop's essence. Hip-hop is always political. Hip-hop is always social. It doesn't matter if it's speaking about stuff that isn't true. Rather, a kid doing gangster rap speaking about violence is being political. The group also seeks to challenge a norm of machismo that goes beyond the genre of hip-hop and extends deeply among many Latin American countries. Gender violence is very complicated because at times it is subtle, hard to see, and it has become normalized in society and we don't even realize it. So I emphasize these things and that is what I'm doing now. And beyond the MC, the collective outlines broadly that hip-hop is also based on street art, breakdance, and the musical compositions and mixes by a DJ. Above all, they argue that the genre is participatory and accessible. Painting in the street is better because people that may not be able to go to other places, perhaps for monetary reasons, can see and appreciate it in the street. And in the streets, neighborhoods, public schools and cultural centers is where this group of women take their art, carry out workshops and hope to form future generations of critical and creative thinkers. Clayton Cantela Sur, Mexico City. That's what we're covering. Plenty more on all of those stories and others at our website, telesurtv.net slash English. Join us on social media as well, Instagram, Facebook uh, and Twitter. For Telesur English, I'm Cody Weddle. We'll see you back here in just a few hours. Ciao.